After years of turmoil and cost-cutting, there seems to be renewed optimism amongst oil and gas companies with a recovery in energy prices. But what lessons have been learnt and what challenges still remain? Well, I sat down with Lorenzo Simonelli, the CEO of BHGE, at their annual meeting here in Florence to discuss. <laughs> Lorenzo, let me ask you about the journey of the company. You've been given this huge responsibility to turn two different companies with two different cultures into one as well. It's not just about cost cutting. It's not just about synergies. That is a very important point. That's what a lot of shareholders want to look at as well. But for you, tell me about the transformation of these two companies into one, the challenges and, and, and how exciting it is, I guess, as well. Oh, it's very exciting, Stephen. It's uh, great to see you here in Florence because uh, this is really about creating a new entity within the oil and gas industry and bringing together two great traditional capabilities of Baker Hughes in the oil field services, G-Oil and Gas from an equipment perspective. And when you put them together, uh, you're creating a differentiated company. Mm -hmm. And we're in our seventh month. We started trading on the New York Stock Exchange July 5th of 2017. And I'm very pleased by what we've done from an integration perspective, bringing the teams together, but also with the capabilities now that we can provide our customers. Uh, what we're talking about is really driving productivity. Mm -hmm. How do we bring down total cost of ownership? How do we bring assets into production? How do we drive productivity and then digital enablement? Mm -hmm. And we're the company that can do that because we actually have that capability now that we've brought together Baker Hughes and But, but it's a very mass. weird thing in some ways because you've got, uh, and I've seen it here in Florence, cutting edge technology, left, right and centre. You, you, you really want to build upon that. A lot of R&D. But at the same time, you're, you're looking and thinking, right, well, how can I cut a few cents here? How can I cut a, a few dollars here? Because and, and, that's very difficult because you've promised a lot of synergies as well. Yes, we have. And yet at the same time, you want to grow. So you're, you're growing and cutting at the same time. That's an interesting conundrum for any CEO. So as you look at, uh, clearly we've got the short term focus and you've got the longer term focus. And I'm glad to say that synergies are on track. We even mentioned that uh, on our earnings call last week. And we feel good about the ramp up that we see in those synergies. The synergies though are really the merging of the two companies. Uh, when you think about rooftops, you think about supply chain consolidation, that's normal block and tackling. Then you get into the aspect of what you can do from a longer term perspective and the impact you can have by bringing the two companies together and driving productivity in the projects. And that's the exciting piece for our customers. So it's really managing that short-term and longer-term focus. I'm a former GM myself, of course, being a CNBC employee. I just wonder, what is it that's very succinct about what GE does when it goes into a company, the culture of a GE company that, of course, you've been at GE a huge amount of your career as well. What is it that GE does actually in terms of bringing Baker Hughes into the, the culture? Is there something special about GE or is actually it, it's just the same wherever you go? So I've, I'd say the special things about GE is, number one, what it can do from a global technology reach. Right. Uh, with the global research centers, there's a huge amount of materials, knowledge, a huge amount of uh, additive work that's being done. You look at the digital centers that they have. All of that now becomes an area that we can use. And then also the global reach. Uh, when you think about the history and the number of countries, the affiliation with infrastructure that we can take to governments. There's also the aspect of uh, you know the processes and process discipline. So that's what we get from GE. But what we're doing from a Baker Hughes G perspective is really creating also our own identity within the industry. Mm. And we're leveraging the entrepreneurial side. We're leveraging also uh, the aspects of oil field services. How do we make sure we're close to our customers? Uh, how do we have the intensity with our customers? And all of that is blending into our culture. And uh, I'm very pleased with the way it's progressing. Tell me about full stream, because I think that's part of the identity of BHG that you're talking about. It is, and it, you know, it's a very appropriate word when you actually understand what makes up this business. And I'd say we're unique in the industry because we do play in the upstream. So we have the capability to help our customers from an exploration, a production perspective. We also play in the midstream because of our rotating equipment within the pipelines. And then we play in the downstream when you look at the refineries, petrochemicals, and assisting our customers there. So when we looked at this, you know, we are unique in that we can actually go 
wing to wing across all of the areas of a large international oil company, large national oil company. And that's why we came up with the term full stream. Mm. Now, it sounds very markety, but it helps to really explain the breadth of the capability we have. And then we dig into the different segments and how do we integrate solutions? How do we really drive a cost per barrel focus, a dollar per megawatt focus for our customers? That benefit of the synergy that you have, that you mentioned on R&D, on developing products, developing uh, materials and what have you as well, that would be lost if you weren't part of the GE family, wouldn't it? So it wouldn't be lost because we actually have the appropriate intercompany agreements that would be retained. And as I mentioned before, we really act as a channel to the industry for GE technology. Mm -hmm. It's in both companies' benefit to maintain that. And so when people talk about what's going to happen to the GE stake, does that mean you're not going to have access? Uh, GE wants to continue to be able to provide technology into the oil and gas industry. And our presence uh, is a key channel for that. How has life changed post COP21? How different is it when you've got, obviously, the renewable side of things champing at the bit, you've got governments who aren't necessarily being honest with their populations about the speed of which they're going to bring renewables on in scale as well, trying to keep the investment on board and say to them, no, it cannot be that way. It has to be an energy mix. And every single product that we have and are developing now is going to be needed 2030, 2040. How difficult is it explaining to the greater public to shareholders that actually oil and gas really does have a big future. You know, Steve, that's one of the big areas that we as an industry need to do a better job of advocating for oil and gas. And we do have a role to play. And we have a role to play also in the environmental footprint mm. and low carbon footprint. If you look at the gas, for example, that is a cleaner hydrocarbon. If you look at oil, oil's not going away but then you look at the way in which you can decrease the footprint of CO2 from the extraction of oil, the different pieces of equipment we use, also the processes we deploy. So what we're really saying to the industry is let's work together and let's actually go and be proactive at addressing the low carbon footprint. Yeah. Let's start to introduce more of an image of we're doing the right things, we've got the right products, we've got the right processes in place, and we can actually, I think, make uh, huge leaps with regards to the impression people have. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm going to say, uh, st make a statement and you can comment on it. I don't think politicians are necessarily being honest with their populations, with their voters, about what is achievable and what is not achievable. Uh, and they have to just get real about hydrocarbons. There you go. I've said that. How do you feel about that? So I won't speak to politics because I'm not a politician. What I will and you have say, to deal with these governments as well. What I will say is... There is a role for hydrocarbons in the oil and gas industry for decades to come. And there is a transition within the energy mix that is clearly happening. Um, but for people to think that it's all going to be renewables five years from now, I think is uh, not realistic. And gas is clearly something that is growing and the presence of oil is going to continue. But it has ramifications for you directly. I'm just thinking about shareholder base, about pension funds, about sovereign wealth funds who come out with these great protestations. We're not going to invest in hydrocarbons or we're not going to invest in companies that are heavily dependent on oil and gas as well. So it kind of does have shareholder implications for you as a CEO. It does. And what we've got to do, though, is, again, I think go proactively, send our message and also put actions behind our message. So. If you look at uh, the way in which we're tackling it, we're now introducing products that clearly show we're reducing the CO2 footprint. Uh, we're linking in also um, our products that can be utilized with renewables. So if you think about a, a gas turbine and then also a wind turbine, they can actually play together in mm -hmm. different fields and different projects. So how do we actually work together and show that we can move forward in the energy mix. Is a company like BHG going down the renewables path, is that a dangerous money pit and a distraction? Look, right now, our focus is the oil and gas industry and what we're doing. Relative to the carbon footprint, it's all gonna be relative to the oil and gas. We're staying very much focused in the industry we're in and supporting our customers in the industry we're in. From a renewables perspective, there's other businesses within GE that we can link into 
Uh, my focus though and the focus of the team is very much to enable the oil and gas industry. In terms of the oil price, if we do see more volatility, do you fear though that the oil price and the distraction of that, if we do see a downtick, because we've had a very good run to the upside, that actually is going to dent appetite across the industry? I think you're seeing some of that apathy with some of the big projects still being delayed mm. and uh, customers and uh, large IOCs are going to be temperate during the course of 18. Uh, supply and demand is rebalancing, so there'll be a need for these projects to go forward. Uh, I think people are though, uh, definitely saying, let's not look at Brent WTI on a daily basis. Let's look at the fundamentals of the industry and then make the right decision. Total cost of ownership is really a focus that I think we've got to have so that we can handle any external pricing. Lorenzo, there's not one person that doesn't look at Brent on a WTI on a daily basis, and there's not one of them, despite what they say to me, perhaps including you, that doesn't look at their share price every day. We all look at it. We do, <laughs> we do. And clearly from an aspect of daily basis, we can't make decisions sure. though for the long term on what's happening. Uh, we've got to make the right decisions that, first of all, from a company perspective, BHG is going to be here for a long, long time. And we want to make sure we're growing with the industry and also our customers as well. Uh, they want to make sure that the projects are going forward at the right time. What do you think of the, I mean, just looking at from an apolitical point of view, what do you think of the OPEC, non-OPEC deal? I think it, it, it changed the basis. I mean, so many people, especially state size, if I may say, have been trying to call the end of OPEC for a very long time. OPEC plus, i.e. the Russians, basically, it, it looks incredibly robust, doesn't it? Look, what they did last year, well, actually in uh, November, November 16, of 2016, yeah. was uh, remarkable uh, coming up with the agreement. It's clearly provided a more stable environment, and it will be interesting to see how long that plays out. Mm. Uh, people are suggesting that it may go through 219. I think a lot's going to depend on the external aspect of demand. Mm. Um, you've got uh, demand that is increasing robustly. At a stage, uh, they'll decide that they've got to increase production rates. Yeah, when you talk to Fadi Birol um, from the IEA, and I'm, I'm sure you've had similar conversations, or people like Dan Jurgen, who obviously wrote the book on Middle East oil, a lot of these guys don't like the idea of OPEC trying to manipulate the market or trying to kind of create a certain level and what have you, and they worry about the ramifications. So Fadi Birol says, just leave it to the market. That's what he says to me on a regular basis. Do you fear it could go too far and condemn demand? No, I think uh, r right now um, there is a lot that happens geopolitics-wise yeah. that obviously has an impact on the industry. That's going to play through during the course of 2018. And, you know, we've got to stay focused on what we do for the industry, yeah. which is really with the products and the services that we provide being at the best cost point for them to go forward with regards to their projects. I think also the other externality you've got to keep on focused on is what's happening to that demand rate. Ha yeah. What uses do we have? And things will clearly sort themselves out, but geopolitics plays a role. I'm interested in what you think of shale as well, because shale has become the other swing producer. We always yes. call it Saudi. And so, and so in terms of shale, people are always trying to underestimate it, saying, oh, well, it's going to be over by 2022, or it's going to be over by 2025. The utilization rates are going to fall off aggressively as well. What, what's your very educated view on, on how long we've got such explosive growth in shale for? So, um, I think if you go back in time, uh, people say the shale revolution. People knew that it was there. Yeah. It was how do you extract it? How do you make it competitive? And what's enabled it is technology. And what's going to enable it going forward is technology as well. Uh, technology is really the benefit to this industry as we continue to progress and go forward. So how long will it go on for? It really depends on how we continue to advance technology. There is the resource. Um, there's uh, a lot of uh, activity in the Permian at the moment. Mm. And we feel that uh, there's an opportunity for increased rates. Now, will it go up to an exponential of replacing uh, and being able to triple, quadruple? Mm. I think only time will tell. I I'd say the progression is going to be less accelerated than people think. Because, again, I'm just looking at all the vast amount of commentary I hear stateside, uh, and very often there's this dream of energy independence. And then when you question people and say, well, I'm in broader North America, so they get, despite NAFTA, they'll get Mexico and Canada in there as well. And they say, we want to be independent of the Middle East. And yet the former Secretary General of OPEC, Mr. Albadri, said, look, what is the Americans' problem? We've been reliable 
um, uh, deliverers of product for 40 years. You know, so it, there is this kind of attitude somewhere stateside that they don't want Middle East, but they want energy independence. Is, is that ever going to happen? I think, um, again, in, in a context of isolation, you can say energy independence. Uh, global trade is here to stay. Yeah. It's a good thing uh, as we continue to see the developed world increase in prosperity. And also, you've got to look at the mix as well. Sure. Uh, so you, you need the refineries, you need light crude, you need heavy crude. You also need the LNG mm. that gets transported around the world. So I think we're actually stronger when we see the aspect of global trade taking place, also in oil and gas. Um, very big difference between the administrations of how Mr. Obama and Mr. Trump view the oil industry, how they view pipelines, how they de view development of renewables versus hydrocarbons as well. What has the change of administration meant for how you've been able to do business in the States? So um, if you look at the Trump administration, clearly the tax change that's happened, that's imp impacting all of us. And going from a 35 down to a 21%, that is a good thing over the long term. Uh, if you look at um, regulation, uh, not all regulation is bad, sure. uh, but you can have too much regulation. So allowing uh, the permitting, allowing things to go forward is good. And look, we're, we are supportive of trade. We're supportive of business. Mm -hmm. And so governments that support that as well is a good thing. But it, it's, I mean, Mr. Trump has been... I'm going to say this, has he been unambiguously good for the uh, hydrocarbon industry in America? It's clearly had a positive impact on the hydrocarbon. If you look at um, his tenure to date, uh, he's supportive of the hydrocarbon industry. Yeah. So in terms of where you go next as well, what's your career aspiration as well? Do you see yourself um, as an oil man or potentially as a uh, future inheritor of the CEO job at GE? So first of all, I love what I do. So I love to be able to run companies. I love the oil and gas industry. I love what I'm doing today. This is a great opportunity to really create something new, something differentiated. We brought together two great brands, yeah. Baker Hughes, General Electric, to create a differentiated offering within the oil and gas industry. And as I've been told before, and I'll mention to yourself, you know, stay focused on what you're doing today. Yeah. Do it well. Let the career take care of itself. My ambitions are to run BHG the best I can for all shareholders. What, what drives you personally? I mean, uh, one of your team told me off the record what, that you, you don't sleep. <laughs> you're like a machine kind of, you're always awake, you're always messaging or working on something. So what drives you? A passion to improve, a passion to be able to create new things, also to develop teams. Uh, develop new innovative ways commercially. I like progress mm. and moving ahead. So the aspect of not enjoying sleep is because there's so much to do. <laughs> do you need sleep? Ah, How everybody many hours do you needs need? sleep. Uh, everybody also, needs sleep. You hear about successful for they only need about four or five hours. How many do you need? You're in the ballpark. <laughs> That's incredible. Lorenzo Simonelli, a man who very rarely sleeps. Nice to see you. Sir. Thank, thank you very you. much. That was Lorenzo Simonelli, the CEO of BHGE, in conversation with CNBC. Until next time, I'm Steve Sedgwick in Florence. Thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Tanya Bryant, and thank you for watching CNBC Conversation. If you want to watch another episode, just click on the videos. And don't forget to subscribe to CNBC Life for the very best in feature programming. Thank you so much for watching.